about a half a mile. Yeah, just south of the, the one the of the worst spots. Yeah. I think it was yeah, 196 is the, is the mile marker. Yeah. And you can still see these all over. There's still some in Eureka, Lolita, all over. Um, so for a little while, they are actually making a bit of a profit, but the problem is, is that they just can't keep up with uh, repairs. This is actually a pretty impressive train for uh, Eureka Summit, and it doesn't lapse. Um, that's the Lolita Tunnel. A lot of people loved riding the North Coast Daylight, but again, it just didn't last. It's actually a, a dome car right there, pretty beautiful. Um, so just after 18 months, it was already in the financial hole. Um, a man named Jerry Gregg is appointed a, a, a trustee, and he proceeds to allow the illegal scrapping and removal of over 28 miles of spurs and siding. So what they basically did is they eviscerated the railroad in order to settle some of the debt. But according to Dan Hauser, who I've talked about, he said that functionally it made it hard to run the railroad because you didn't have enough passing tracks, sidings, spurs, all the things you need to feed mainline business. And it's actually during this time, if any of you have been to Blue Lake, uh, there was a spur that went all the way to the Mad River Brewery. And they actually scrapped it during that time, and then later they scrapped the whole AMR. And we see the end of yet another era. Um, I think it's interesting that you can see these locomotives, they're so covered in oil because they worked really hard and they were already on like their third railroad. Uh, they were very worn out by the time they left. And I believe at least two of them are still running today, back east. So 1992, um, it's actually our buddy Dan Hauser. He authors the bill. Um, it's the North Coast Railroad Authority, which is the current owner. Um, it was passed in the law, however, the funding was vetoed. So, um, ends up becoming a California specialty, the unfunded mandate. <laughs> so, uh, the railroad was now um, operated under the name North Coast Railroad and would barely see six years of operations. Um, and they, they really, they did try. They ran very, very worn out locomotives on very badly worn track. See Rika Slew Ridge. Um, runs tired out lo locomotives on badly worn track, $5.5 million in debt and losing thousands of dollars a month, financial problems that could further delay efforts to run commuter <laughs> trains. Yet its black and red locomotives continue to snake through spectacular wilderness, hauling loads of timber, plywood, and wood pulp from sawmills in Blue Lake and Scotia, fresh milk from dairies and creameries near Fortuna, frozen seafood from Eureka, fish processors, um, grain from Petaluma and his train crews still ogle river otters and golden eagles along the way. And if you've never been deep into the canyon, just that one day I was there, uh, I saw two bald eagles. Pretty amazing. This is right down there in First Street. That locomotive is still in Eureka. That's way back in the day. Um, so really, they, they tried. They really, really tried. And in 1998, this is the Port Seward Depot. This is the only one that's remaining. That's a vintage picture of it. Um, 1997 ends up spending, spelling the absolute end. Um, so there was an El Nino storm event near Shellville that blocked all outgoing traffic from NWP. Uh, with no money to fund maintenance, the canyon was actually kept alive on a volunteer basis. Um, because of poor accounting, the FEMA money was misused and then cut off. So they couldn't even apply for more disaster money. And by April of 98, it had turned into a roller coaster. This is down near Shellville. The water is actually completely inundating the tracks. Which near where? Shellville. <laughs> it's where the railroad left the north end and actually went out to the main rail network. It's in Napa County. By Sonoma. By Sonoma, yeah. And it's actually where they're headquartered now because the railroad is still alive down there. This is a Dan Hauser picture. You can see the sinks and washouts. Scotia Bluffs laying some track there, but it's just not enough. Uh, they continued to try to do excursion trains until they were actually told the tracks weren't safe enough to do so, and they were shut down, so they couldn't, they didn't have that extra revenue in the last uh, year or so. Is it pouring? Yes, it is. <laughs> hey, there you go. See? <laughs> a little more rain. A little more rain. This is, uh, this is another Dan Hauser picture. Uh, this is just another thing that would happen continuously in NWP. And it just got worse and worse and worse in the 90s. And this is pretty much where it ends. Um, 
I mentioned the Facebook page I have. Um, people have been reaching out to us, not just the pictures. Pictures are great, but stories are critical, and I love that they're in text so I can save them. Um, there was actually someone who contacted me, and he was there on the day that they um, tried to finish the tracks and get them reopened. Uh, so I'll show you that in a sec, but this is, this is just amazing. This is um, on a rainy Tuesday in February 1998 when train engineer Nick Mitchell and conductor Gary Kittleson chugged down a South Fork Station miserable storm, hauling more than $500,000 worth of high-grade redwood. They were headed for a rendezvous with a northbound train at the Island Mountain Station, an unpopulated outpost and a stretch of track so secluded it winds for 70 miles without a road crossing. Uh, just before five, horizontal rain beat against the windshields. Uh, and the men heard the first distress call from the train, Master Ferguson. He radioed Mitchell that foul weather had turned their sister train back south. So the northbound didn't make it. This is really fitting, I love this oh, no. <laughs> So even worse, a critical situation loomed straight ahead. Just a quarter mile down the line, the incessant rains had created a condition local conductors know as swinging traffic. With the ground washed out from beneath them, the rails dangled in mid-air like a windblown suspension bridge. I told them to get those locomotives out of there, to drop their load, and come on home. Even after ditching the heavy load, the men escaped with little time to spare. A few hours later, the rains washed out more than 300 feet of track just north of them, stranding the cargo on an island less than a mile long. And there it is. They did recover the lumber in 2001. Um, but the train is still there. Can you confirm, is it still there today? Yeah. Yep. Okay, it didn't roll off anywhere, it's still there. Um, and from Most what I understand... Most of the lumber was rotten. What's that? Most of the Douglas fir lumber was rotten. Was it? It right inside those, inside the closed cars and it was all rotten. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of it was packaged up. Yeah. And you can see the tracks are actually washing out from underneath the, uh, the cars. Um, and one of the last things I'll leave you with here today, um, it's really crazy to think that we were very close to reconnecting. Um, the summer of 1998, they had actually worked really hard to get the tracks reopened. Um, and this is something I haven't seen much um, actually <coughs> written about. Um, this is at a spot, I believe this is near the uh, Tunnel 29. And one of these, um, one of these people that contacted me on the Facebook page, um, his name is Aaron Francis. He said, the final moves from the north were made by Clyde Ferguson and Gary Kittleson, I believe. They went out to 197.40, it's a wild post, to retrieve a ca 